today on our podcast, we are talking safeguarding. We're talking with Martin Baker and Mike Glanville of One Team Logic, uh, my concern, and they are experts in this field. So I'm just your humble facilitator today because I've got experts in the building who are going to be guiding us through what safeguarding should look like in schools on the back of their recently written book, Lessons Will Be Learned, Transforming Safeguarding in Education. So welcome, Martin and Mike, to the podcast. Thank you very much. Great to be here. Yeah, thanks very much, Alicia. Great, great to be here this morning. It's lovely to have you. Could you introduce yourselves briefly to our audience, please? Uh, yeah, sure. Shall I go ahead? So I'm Martin Baker. Uh, I'm the CEO of One Team Logic, and I need to make two quick confessions. Uh, firstly, I'm a recovering police officer. Um, so I was uh, a police officer for 38 years. Um, I joined as a child, quite obviously. Um, and uh, then uh, I have also been a, a second conversion of a school governor, and uh, I'm now a director of a multi academy trust in addition to my day job. So I've been involved, involved in schools governance for about 15, uh, 16 years now. So, uh, yeah, but our day to day job is uh, one team logic and safeguarding in education. Thank you. Yeah. Mike. Yeah, hi. Yes, my name is Mike Glanville, and, um, and uh, as Martin, very similar to Martin, I'm, I'm also in recovery as a, a former police officer. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, early in my career, I was actually a child protection officer uh, back in the, uh, it was a long, long time ago, Alicia, back in the 80s, um, and spent a lot of my career working on child protection cases and involved in, well, actually both adult uh, and child safeguarding. Um, and when I left the police uh, back in 2012 um, and then worked very closely with Martin, uh, co-founding One Team Logic uh, and obviously being very heavily involved in the development of uh, my concern and uh, all of the other safeguarding services that we provide. Um, but I'm also a school governor, so similar to Martin, I'm a, a school governor at uh, a small primary school in Dorset uh, here in the UK. Welcome. So lovely to have you both with me on this episode of the podcast. I, I actually read your book and I thought it was a fantastic read. And even though it's really based um, on the British system, I think there are lessons in there for every school in every part of the world. So we're going to dive in there a little bit today and look at some of the things that are in the book, but we're gonna go wider afield because when you have experts in the building, you have to utilize them for the, the general good of the people, right? So we want to know uh, why, why is the topic of safeguarding so important? Why should we stop and pay attention right now? I mean, I'll kick off if you like, Leisha. I mean, yeah. I think you need to you know, really pay attention because the consequences of getting, getting it wrong are just so, um, you know, significant, very serious, aren't they? On the yeah, and the impact it can have on children's lives, the you know the, the lives of, uh, of of family members of children that may may be affected. The the impact it can have on staff in schools, um, and we we know that um, you know if you look back um, over the past and and look into the past, you can you can uh, you can you know look at some of those high profile cases that we that we've seen and the impact the kind of impact that has. On people's lives, um, and of course, you know, one of the I think major reasons why, particularly in education, why safeguarding is just so critical is because that, you know, we need children need to be, um, you know, uh, able to flourish, and they need to be, if they're going to learn, they need to be in, in an environment which is safe. They need to feel secure, don't they? Um, so I think for for everybody, I think safeguarding in education is just such an important uh, topic. But it's not easy, um, you know, to get this right. We've, you know, despite all of the um, efforts um, uh, over the years to, to to try and get safeguarding right, we're still, aren't we, seeing some major problems? I mean, over here in the UK, you know, just very recently, we've seen, um, you know, all of the uh, the stuff that's appearing in the in the media, haven't we, on peer on peer abuse? You know, um, and that's not unusual. I would say actually that one of the biggest problems facing schools is peer on peer abuse, whether that's actually in school and on site or online. 
um, is probably one of the biggest risks that schools are having to face, you know, globally. Uh, it's not, not just here in the UK. So um, it's a yeah, critically important topic, um, and it's so important to get it right uh, for the benefit of, of everybody, but particularly the children in, in school. Yeah, I agree. Anything to add, Martin? No, I mean, I think, you know, Martin hit the, hit the nail on the head, really. The consequences of adverse childhood experiences are absolutely enormous. Uh, so actually identifying issues at an early stage uh, and then being able to step in and stop those issues escalating uh, is absolutely fundamental uh, because there is no doubt when you look at all of the, the, the research, the health research um, around adverse childhood experiences, those things that happen in childhood and those repeated uh, adverse experiences uh, really uh, do uh, make you know such a difference to people's life chances um, you know their their vulnerability to issues such as drug abuse alcohol abuse becoming involved in criminality uh, and committing suicide you know there's very clear evidence that if you can avoid those adverse childhood experiences those sorts of issues can be absolutely minimized so schools have got a really critical role to play at uh, act you know, throughout a, a, a student's time in school to ensure that they help to minimise and avoid those adverse experiences in childhood. Yeah, I, I agree with you. It actually leads me nicely to my next point, because while I was reading the book, you mentioned um, a little bit of a case study or, you know, an incident with a safeguarding lead in a school. Her name was Sue in the book, and you were there helping her to um, implement your, your software to make her job easier. Um, and she was just touched by the fact that someone else cared enough to come up with something to make her work less demanding. But what I wondered, why is the role of the safeguarding lead such a demanding one in schools? Yes, it, it, was, it was myself that actually uh, was talking to Sue on that occasion in that case study. Uh, and I have to say, it was incredibly moving, you know, actually working through the software with somebody and actually seeing them start to cry because they just couldn't believe that somebody was paying attention to all of the pressure on them as a safeguarding lead and all the, the concerns and worries that they carry around in their head on bits of paper, written in a day book, post-it notes, emails, all those sorts of things, actually. Uh, clearly, this lady passionately cared about the children uh, in her setting uh, and really wanted to do her very best and was really struggling uh, with the demands, many of which were kind of administrative demands almost, actually, how do I organise and get myself organised? Uh, and I've seen that now on a number of occasions. Uh, and that's, you know, one of the other fundamental reasons why safeguarding is so important is to support the people whose responsibility is safeguarding. Uh, now, safeguarding is everyone's responsibility in education, but for yes. the safeguarding lead, they carry a very special responsibility uh, for actually uh, fundamentally ensuring the safety of all the children in, in the care of that school. So it really is a very demanding job. Uh, and not only is it demanding uh, emotionally, but it's demanding professionally, knowing what action to take in a huge range of different scenarios that crop up as safeguarding. Uh, you know, safeguarding, historically, we'd have talked about only child protection, uh, and that would have been a fairly narrow focus in terms of physical abuse, uh, sexual abuse, uh, you know, emotional abuse and neglect. Actually, now, it's a far wider range of issues that go to the heart of the well-being and pastoral needs uh, of a child. Uh, broadly the non-academic needs of a child, but actually that will have a, a real impact on their academic achievements and their ability to thrive in education. So it is a, a wide range of issues. And of course, people turn to the safeguarding lead in uh, schools uh, and expect them to come up with the answer about how to deal with any number of uh, different scenarios uh, and range of issues. So there, professionally, there is a huge amount expected of a safeguarding lead. Uh, and in the book, we talk about the real uh, importance of uh, schools providing professional and emotional support 
to their safeguarding leads uh, because sometimes people are in that role for very many years uh, and they're dealing with repeated incidents that actually uh, are, you know, can wear them down, uh, really can because of, of the severity of some of those issues or the repeated uh, issues. So for us, one of the fundamental uh, reasons for us writing the book was actually to support safeguarding leads and give them uh, to uh, an, a, an approach, a way of thinking about and approaching the job that they do that will help them to cope uh, and also respond strategically as well as tactically to all the issues that they're faced with. Um, so they're a huge part of the picture too. And Sue is just, I think, uh, an example of somebody who reflects the experience of many, many safeguarding leads. Yeah, I wonder if schools ought to have several safeguards. I know safeguarding is the responsibility of every teacher, every adult in a school, but mm. for one person to bear that burden, I'm wondering if schools ought to rethink how they appoint, how long the tenure, mm. and how many people there are as safeguarding leads in a school. What do you think, Mike? Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more, Leisha. Uh, and as Martin said, you know, it's the, the, the role of the safeguarding lead has just become so much more complex. Um, you know, there's much more demand uh, being placed now on the shoulders of the safeguarding lead for all sorts of different reasons. Um, that, you know, a, there's, a, there's a lot more they need to manage on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of the, and the number of issues that they're, they're having to deal with. But of course, as well with social trends and all of, uh, and so on, you know, we're seeing a lot more complexity, aren't we? You know, um, you know, particularly I think in the online, you know, sort of world, you know, there's a there's a lot more for the safeguarding lead, I think, now to, to have to think about in terms of technology and on, online risk, um, which you know clearly, you know, uh, you know, didn't exist, you know, for, you know, probably ten years ago. So the role the role has changed hugely. I think in terms of um, you know how schools are kind of managing the role of the safeguarding lead. Um, you know what we're seeing is you know are the, certainly the larger organisations are, are taking that 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 approach, Lucia. So they are putting in place safeguarding teams, um, and very often now that the, the safeguarding lead is a dedicated person uh, in that role. Sometimes with uh, uh, you know a background in safeguarding. So for example, you you might find. Uh, you know, a DSL or, or a child protection lead who's actually got a background in social work or policing, for example. Um, so we are beginning, I think, to see the kind of professionalization of the safeguarding role uh, in schools, because I think a lot of schools are recognizing that it's, you know, it requires that kind of status. Um, there's, um, you know, if you look at the job description uh, or job descriptions for, for safeguarding leads. I would say probably five years ago when Martin and I were sort of really starting off with, with some of this work with schools, you know, quite a number of schools didn't, didn't have a job description for, for the dedicated safeguarding lead in place. Um, uh, most, I say, or the majority of schools, I would say, probably now either have a, a job description in place or um, certainly have a reference within their code, within their, because a lot of them are obviously... Um, have other roles, you know, there could be assistant heads, deputy heads, and in some cases, head teachers. Um, so they're, they're juggling a lot of responsibility. So being really clear about what the, what the responsibilities are in relation to the safeguarding um, piece is really important uh, moving forward, I think. Yeah, I, I want to take it outside of the English context, which I think has um, a somewhat developed safeguarding landscape. And I want to take it internationally, if you, if you would allow me to. Mm. And, and I want to also take it a, back, a, a little bit basic. How do schools ensure, or international schools, how can they ensure um, the safety of children? Um, and and you, can, you, can, you can be as basic as you want at this point, because I want to take it to the schools that don't have any of the systems that you talk about in place, where do they begin? Yeah. I mean, I, I think probably the most important thing for me would be the culture of the, of the school. It's so important to get those foundations in place, isn't it? So creating that kind of safeguarding culture um, where 
ultimately what you want, you want pupils and staff to feel that they're in a position to be able to report concerns when there are concerns, that you know, you've got a culture that is open, um, that is trusting, that pupils feel that they can go and talk to you know, adults when they need to, if there is a, if there is a problem. Um, and a lot of the, you know, the, the, um, the problems I think we've been seeing over the years in relation to safeguard, and particularly in schools, is where, where you haven't got that kind of, you know, strong, you know, really rigorous safeguarding culture in place. It's really important, I think, to get those kind of foundations in. Um, and it's, you know, that's, that, that's so important. And making sure then that your policies and your procedures are really clear, um, that actually the staff in the school understand their role and they understand the importance of, uh, you know, being able to report um, concerns, um, you know, and that there's a very clear sort of process in place to enable them to be able to do that. But I think, the, for me, the most important thing for any school, regardless of where you are in the world, is to have that culture in place. And that culture is, you know, there's a buy-in to that culture from everybody in the organisation. You right. know, whether you're a school governor at the top of the organisation or a senior leader, or whether you're somebody um, or, or a pupil or even, you know, even parents, you know, I think everybody needs to buy into that, uh, into that culture, into that approach. That's, 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 I think, the starting point, I think, for any, um, you know, um, any effective safeguarding practice that, that goes on within a school. And I think that that really is uh, something that has to be tackled head on, because, for example, many international schools are part of a, a, a school's group. They will maybe have joined that schools group having been an individual school previously. So bringing those schools together, particularly across different geographies, across different cultures, to ensure that there is a safeguarding culture right across your school group is something you've really got to pay attention to uh, and work hard at. Uh, and of course, lots of those schools will be employing staff from the country that the school is based in. Yeah. Uh, and that culture outside the school might be very different to the culture that's inside the school. So working with those staff, uh, um, particularly there, there's inevitably uh, going to be language uh, issues, translation and so forth, for some of those staff where English isn't their first language. So to get that culture of safeguarding in uh, international schools really does require leadership, leadership from uh, the uh, directors or, or, or trust board members, however you're set up, leadership from the senior leaders uh, across the organisation, and of course all of the principals, head teachers uh, across that organisation too, because uh, many of these settings, children will be away from home, they may not be day pupils, they may be uh, staying away from home for extended periods, so the responsibility that you have goes beyond perhaps the seven or eight hours that you're in school every day, to actually meeting all of their pastoral needs for the time that they're at school. So when you've got that much complexity in the system, it's really important that that culture uh, is led uh, and led very clearly from the top and that you make sure, check that that culture is actually working in practice. It's okay saying, yeah, we have a policy. Gosh, we have a poster on the wall. And uh, how do you know it's actually happening mm -hmm. on the and that's, you know, really fundamentally establishing that culture, but then test that it's actually working. Yeah, I, I agree with you on establishing the culture, especially within the school. And there are times when the culture within the school has to be so open and trusting because the culture outside of the school is one of denial and one in which um, people pretend none of the things are happening I mean, how do, how do schools handle the fact that they might come against this cultural block? Yeah, I think that's an interesting one. Uh, uh, and it's amazing. We, we talk about the safeguarding mindset. Uh, uh, and one of the, uh, it's a, a way of really thinking about safeguarding and the type of mindset that you approach safeguarding with. Um, uh, and it's a four box model. Uh, and uh, people will, will understand what that looks like. Um, but actually, it, it tries to, to, to look at the engagement and attitude uh, of schools towards safeguarding and of staff uh, and of governing body, because you can map uh, where people are on that model 
uh, according to their role. Uh, so we talk about if you're in the bottom left hand box, you're in outright denial. You know, there are, you have a, a very poor attitude towards safeguarding and you simply aren't engaging with it because your attitude is this doesn't happen here. Right. <laughs> uh, and we see that, uh, you know, uh, right across the world uh, and in the UK at times. Uh, and it's not always about safeguarding in, in, in totality, but some kind, sometimes it's about a particular issue. Oh, no, we don't have a problem with peer-on-peer -peer abuse or, uh, you know, uh, or, you know, people will pick on specific issues that they will tell you don't happen in their setting, uh, to which our question is, well, actually, have you looked and have you asked? Um, uh, because quite often it's an assumption that it doesn't happen. So that kind of outright denial piece is not unusual. And it's really trying to uh, explain to people fundamentally why it's important to be open-minded. Right. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, one of the best decisions I ever made, you know, in the police service was to think more about the way that I think, you know, because we are all guilty at times of confirmation bias, all these other things uh, that actually can pervade our thinking quite unconsciously at times. So whether somebody has been consciously or unconsciously uh, denying that there's an issue, you've really got to think about the way you think. Yeah. Actually, fundamentally accept that you may be wrong. Right. You start by asking and actually begin with the end in mind. If your outcome is to protect children and young people and to enable them to thrive, then you need to work back. But there are many, many other considerations uh, around what might happen if you're wrong. So it might be a good place to start with thinking about what if I'm wrong and actually, let's work towards how we become proactive leaders in safeguarding, that we're not doing it uh, because we, you know, we're in denial. We're not doing it just to pass an inspection uh, or to a tick box. We're not doing it just so we can react when something happens. But actually, we are proactively leading the conversation in our setting about what is actually going on and how do we uh, approach it and how do we tackle it. You made some very good points there. Think about how you're thinking and ensuring that your safeguarding is started with the end in mind. And if the end is to protect children at all costs, then that's what you have to do. I think you've made some salient points. Um, I, wanna, I wanna jump into the principles of, of harm reduction. You talked about that in your book, and I, and I found it very, very insightful. Um, can you explain to our listeners what it means um, to implement those four principles of harm reduction? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and these four principles, again, are a way of thinking about and approaching the issue of safeguarding. Uh, and one of the fundamental uh, things that you need to do first before you do anything else is understand the context that you're in uh, and identify the risks. Uh, so that understanding is the really fundamental part. What exactly is it that's going on or might be going on? Because I need to understand what those risks are or might be. Uh, and that uh, touches strongly on contextual safeguarding that, that I'm sure might uh, we'll be able to say more about in a minute. Uh, then, actually, take some action to prevent and reduce harm. You know, we see lots of school improvement plans. When you ask, where's the safeguarding improvement plan then? Um, there's less of a, a, an enthusiastic response uh, because, actually, the whole purpose of safeguarding is to prevent and reduce harm. So once you understand what the risks are, then you can actually take some preventative action yeah. rather than simply reacting when things happen. The third principle is about developing in young people the skills and resilience to avoid, resist and recover from harm. Because actually, young people can be very, very resilient, but actually you can inoculate them uh, against certain harms by actually educating them in the first place about what the risks might be and how to respond should, those, should they be faced with those risks. So working with young people to develop their knowledge, understanding, resilience, and their ability, if they are uh, harmed, to recover from that harm is a really important part of the role. And then 
finally engaging with parents, staff, partner agencies and the wider community because they've all got a role to play in preventing and reducing harm as well and they'll help you understand what's going on uh, and there's a kind of little mnemonic to this which is kind of you aid understand act develop those resilient skills uh, and engage with other people who can help you uh, uh, so uade is a really uh, simple way of thinking about it but those four principles really do help you think, I think, in a very sort of constructive way uh, about safeguarding. Yeah. Do you, you want to say something about contextual safeguarding? I think yeah, I was going to say you made the point about contextual safeguarding, and, and uh, it's, a, it's a term that's, you know, now pretty common, uh, over, certainly over here in the UK, Leisha, so it appears in the statutory guidance uh, over here. Um, and it's a really important concept, I think, for safeguarding leads to understand. Uh, contextual safeguarding essentially means uh, those those concerns or those issues that are impacting on extra those extra familial harms. In other words, those issues that are affecting pupils outside of the family home. Um, and of course, that can include peer on peer abuse. It can cl include online harm and so on, particularly harmful sexual behaviour. So it covers a whole range of uh, behaviours and, and concerns. And the approach essentially is actually focusing a lot more on the circumstances around that extra familial harm. <clears throat> so uh, the traditional way, I think, of kind of approaching uh, child protection and safeguarding has been very much to focus on the victim, uh, which uh, obviously there is a need to do that. But this is actually focus on, focusing on where uh, those uh, concerns are actually, or those incidents are actually taking place as one aspect of it. So within a school, it's, as Martin said, really important to understand, you know, the context in the sense that if you're, if you have a problem with peer on peer abuse, for example, you know, understanding where those incidents are actually taking place within the school um, and understanding where even online those, those kind of risks uh, are happening is really crucial to understanding what you might be able to do then to, to prevent those things from happening uh, in the first place. So, so that's one aspect of it. And the other aspect, I think, which is again, really important, equally important, is, uh, is understanding um, individual pupils and their association with other pupils and with other children uh, and with, with adults. Um, so in other words, really understanding their network uh, gives you an insight into uh, what's happening in, in their world and gives you a much broader understanding, I think, of the potential then risk and harm around those, around those individuals. It's a, it's a concept which has been developed by Professor Carleen Furman, who's uh, from the University of Bedfordshire. Um, she started her work back in 2014, 2015, um, and it's now certainly, you know, getting quite a lot of traction, uh, as I say, over here in the UK. It's appearing as, you know, statutory guidance uh, over here. And I would heartily recommend it, you know, to international schools in, in, in kind of in understanding the thinking and the approach, because I think it's incredibly helpful to schools when they're trying to understand uh, some of the problems that they're facing. I, I, I also found your recommendation of having a safeguarding improvement plan to be an excellent one. What might schools include in such a, a plan? I think, the, I mean, I, for me, I think the first thing is, as, as Martin alluded to, is having a really good assessment, uh, Leisha. So it, it always starts off, I think, with a good assessment and a good understanding of the safeguarding trends and the issues within the school. So, um, you know, making sure that you know, you're basing your kind of decisions and your priorities on reliable data uh, to begin with um, is there always has to be, for me, the first step. Um, and then you'll be in a good position to set, you know, you know, proper objectives. You know, what is it you're looking to to achieve? Um, you know, and it's getting out of this, as Martin said, with the safeguarding mindset, it's getting out of that reactive mode and getting into the proactive mode. Um, but in order to do that, you need to get, kind of, you know, anticipate, you know, where you might you might have problems. And one of those issues is really understanding the local context and lo understanding your local school community. And once you're in a position to be able to do that, you're, you're in a much better position to identify then I think the objectives, the kind of objectives you need to be putting in place. 
And then it's all about, I think, having, you know, um, good plans in place um, and holding, holding people to account um, for, those, for those plans. And um, as we said earlier on, it's, it's never about one individual. It's never about, you know, one person in the organisation taking responsibility for that. Um, you know, we very much see safeguarding as a team game. So it's really important that you're bringing other people in as a safeguarding lead into that plan so that you know, people then are taking responsibility for specific aspects um, you know, of the approach that you're taking. Yeah. You know, a key part of that is managing upwards sometimes. It's actually saying, right, we understand now the nature and scale of the risk. What resources do we need to address that? Okay. And sometimes that means going to the board and saying, actually, we need more time to be able to address these issues with students, or we need more people to help us address those issues. We need additional training time with staff, whatever right. it happens to be. It's, it's multidimensional in that sense. Yeah, but I think absolutely vital that schools begin to think in that way, that when they're doing their school improvement plan, right alongside that, they ought to have a safeguarding improvement plan. Yeah. yeah. I want to... Sorry, go ahead. No, 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 I was just going to say, and those activities actually ought to be part of the school improvement plan. In right. a sense, it shouldn't be something separate. It should be actually in improving our school. Yes, we want to drive up academic outcomes, but we also want to improve safeguarding and the experience of our pupils and their ability to learn by creating the right culture uh, and the right environment for them to be able to learn. They are one and the same thing. They are two sides of the same coin. So, yes. Definitely. You know, in a sense, we wouldn't advocate separate safeguarding improvement plans. It should be part of your whole school improvement plan. Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, yes, I was thinking actually that it's a part because it, it hits the whole care protection and guidance um, requirement for schools, especially during the inspection framework. So, yeah. so that also, just to highlight that it ought to be a very vital part of your whole school improvement process. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, can we talk a little bit about something I recently learned about, which is called affluent neglect? And I didn't know much about that, but I recently spoke to someone on this podcast, Anne-Marie Christian, and she's also into safeguarding. And she mentioned affluent if, um, neglect. And it, it struck a chord with me because in international schools, you do tend to get the more affluent um, students in these private schools and that could be an area of concern. Have you heard of it and what should schools look out for? Yeah, I mean, it's, it is something I've heard about and come across, Leisha. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I agree. I think it's something that, um, and we go back again, I think, to, um, you know, I think members of staff being in a position to be able to spot some of the signs and symptoms um, of that particular, you know, that particular issue is a very, uh, it's, um, it's not something necessary that, um, you know, staff may be, you know, kind of looking out for. Uh, but it's, you know, it, it is very much, I would say, um, a problem of the modern world, isn't it? Um, yes. <laughs> And, um, you know, we certainly have seen examples of it and, um, you know, we're going to we'll probably touch on training. But I think, you know, one of the things for me is making sure that staff are really clear about what they should be you know, looking to identify. Um, so, you know, and one of one of the issues will be around, you know, what is actually happening at home, for example. So I think, you know, um, it's easy to it's easy sometimes to forget that. Um, you know, children can be very, very good at hiding what's happening at, uh, at home. Uh, so, you know, being in a position to be able to provide, I think, children with opportunities to open up is, you know, a, a really important uh, part of all of this, you know, giving them the, the channels um, within which they are able to, to, to talk, not necessarily to adults either. It may be talk, you know, in a position to be able to talk to, to friends about this stuff as well. And one of the things I think we've seen with the peer on peer stuff, which I think is you know, relevant to this kind of problem, is you know, schools being in a much better position to understand how pupils are feeling about safety and security. And we don't probably ask enough questions of pupils themselves. Um, 
you know, in that respect. And one of the reasons why I think we see a lot of underreporting, the reasons why pupils don't feel comfortable about reporting to particularly adults, um, is because there's either a lack of trust <laughs> in the in the setting, um, mm -hmm. or they're just not given the opportunity to be able to do that. So I think it's you know, for me, it's 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 really important that uh, children are brought into um, that process, and that by talking to children and, and encouraging them to open up uh, in a, a safe and secure way is is vital, I think, to uncover that kind of problem. Yeah, I, I'm fascinated by it because I never, in my years when I was in in, in schools, I didn't actually think about affluent neglect as something that I should include in my whole safeguarding remit. And, and, and I was in charge of safeguarding funnily enough when I was a vice principal, but I didn't think about affluent neglect until I came to this region and until I you know, started to interact more with international schools. So I think that's an area that we're going to have to develop a little bit more and do some more um, research and case studies yeah. into. But one area that I really want to touch on, especially for our context in this region, is that of safeguarding in recruitment. And wanted to find out from yourselves what international schools can do to be extra vigilant around this topic. Yeah, absolutely critical uh, piece of, uh, uh, of uh, the, uh, the work that needs to be done in safeguarding uh, in international schools. And it's amazing uh, quite often how the recruitment, for example, uh, of new staff uh, is becomes an administrative or an HR task and actually a very tenuous link to safeguarding. Uh, whereas actually it's a fundamental part of safeguarding. It's your first line of defense yep. against pedophiles that want to get access to children. Uh, so it really should be a fundamental part of the safeguarding conversation that's going on in the school. It shouldn't be seen as an administrative task, something separate. Uh, it is absolutely fundamental. And it's interesting how often we see this, uh, that aspect uh, of uh, safeguarding being handled by school bursars, being handled by school receptionists, administrators, and, and it's not. Now, I'm not suggesting for one minute that the safeguarding league needs to perform uh, all of those checks personally, but they do need to have a, a fundamental overview of that process and be able to contribute to that process and the whole recruitment process to be able to ensure that those checks and balances are in place in the, in the first place and that the checks get done. Yes. Uh, I mean, <laughs> what is extraordinary, uh, uh, and we find it, I mean, there are some notorious cases such as those of William Vahey, uh, for example, who was able to teach in international schools for 40 odd years, despite having a conviction in the USA for, for child abuse. Uh, uh, so there really are some fundamental basic things that need to be done, like making sure those checks get done, but also following up on references. Uh, we uh, were talking to a, a school, a major school group who had 38 teachers had moved on over uh, a, a, a holiday period to other roles in international schools. Uh, and you'll be aware there's a reasonable amount of churn uh, in, in teachers in international education. They received not one request from any of the new employers for a reference, let alone somebody actually then calling them and following up on that reference and actually checking that it had been written by the person who purported to have written it, that the content was correct, and so on and so forth. So, again, fundamentally, not only do the checks, but references, following up on references, uh, and making sure that you do follow through. That school actually contacted the new employers and actually said, uh, would you like a reference for this person you've just employed? Because they felt it was their duty to make sure that they were actually... Um, passing on any relevant information that they have. But uh, just being systematic about those things is extremely important. But also then empowering staff with the information and knowledge uh, of the signs and symptoms that they might notice in their other staff members uh, about their conduct towards children. Uh, because there is clearly uh, some very, very um, 
clear principles around that you can be uh, t told about and watch out for. I mean, the grooming, for example, uh, that goes on uh, where you do have a peep bar in place, uh, and this has been seen in international education, it's been seen in sport uh, very strongly. This whole business where not only does the, uh, the offender groom the child, but they groom parents, they groom families, they groom their peers in, who are also teachers, they groom their own management team, they are popular, confident individuals, people that have personality. You know, there's all sorts of things that, and of course, there's loads of people who are like that, who aren't obviously involved in paedophile activity, but it's having the information to be able to piece those thoughts together in your mind, to be able to say, hmm, we just need to pause and think here on a moment. What actually is going on here? Uh, and right. it's an unpleasant thing to be accused of something like that if you're innocent. But goodness me, it's even far more unpleasant to be a child victim of abuse. Um, so, you know, I think we professionally have to accept that sometimes we will be challenged about our behaviour and our approach. That's part of a good, healthy system of accountability. Uh, but absolutely, uh, doing things right, doing the right things uh, is really important. And also, low-level concerns are, are really important to be able uh, to allow you to piece together right. some of those issues. We, we talk in the book uh, about some work that's been done by Farrer & Co., uh, 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 who actually are uh, a uh, uh, company of, uh, of lawyers who specialise in this particular area. Uh, and they... Uh, produced a really helpful guide to the recording of low-level concerns and what low-level concerns actually are, what that means, uh, but actually how it helps you to build that picture. Uh, uh, and there is, you know, no substitute for relentless vigilance, I'm afraid. You know, you cannot just make an assumption that everything's okay until it isn't okay. You have to be relentlessly vigilant. Uh, and that does put big responsibility on the safeguarding lead, but also other people within the school uh, to ensure that they do have to grasp sometimes the metal uh, and actually say something and put their hand up and just raise that concern because it might just uh, you know, unlock access to a world of harm that can be prevented. Yeah, I think, I think it all goes right back to developing that culture within mm. the school. The end in mind, if the end is that you are doing everything possible to ensure the safeguarding of the students within your care, then the recruitment lines up and the training and the procedures of how you report, whether it's a low level or whether it's something that is of critical concern, all of that all has to be in place. If the end is to ensure safeguarding. It's been a fascinating conversation, but we're not done yet. We're, we're, we're not done yet. <laughs> yes, yes, Mike, what would you like to add? Yeah, no, just a couple of points on the, on the, on the safeguarding culture in the context of recruitment, Leisha, because I think it's, as you say, it's so important. And I, you've got to kind of put our minds, you know, put ourselves in the mind of a paedophile in a sense. You know, the fact that, um, you know, they'll be looking for the easiest route into, a, into an organisation. So if your safeguarding culture is really strong and you've got good, you know, really good recruitment processes in place. So, for example, you know, I think in the in the actual recruitment process itself. So when you're actually, you know, shortlisting and when you're you know, conducting interviews, for example. So when you're actually having contact with new recruits or candidates, you know, you need to be asking them questions, safeguarding, you know, questions. Um, and making it very clear to, to candidates the kind of safeguarding culture you have in your organisation. And I can pretty much guarantee that anybody that's looking uh, to kind of, you know, inveigle themselves into, into the organisation, if they are kind of of that mind, will, uh, will, will not want to, uh, you know, be part of an organisation that's got really strong safeguarding uh, procedures and policies in place, you know. And I think that kind of, as Martin said, it's the first line of defence. It's your first opportunity, really, um, to be able to tackle somebody who may be presenting a very, very significant threat um, and may come across, as Martin said, as somebody who's actually very popular uh, and may actually be receiving really good referencing 
or references from other organizations so it's it's that kind of it's that vigilance really from day one i think in that recruitment process which is so important yeah yes very very important what about training how often how much <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, training is such a big issue, isn't it? It's, um, I mean, clearly for the safeguarding lead or the leads, um, I mean, training is absolutely essential. We said right, you know, right, right at the start of the uh, of the podcast, you know, the kind of the demands that are now being placed on on safeguarding leads, the complexity of the role, it's really essential that they have good, high quality uh, safeguarding training, uh, and that you know they're they're keeping themselves up to date. Uh, in between their formal training because there's just so much change happening I think in the world of safeguarding um, you know we mentioned social trends but you know you look at the, the kind of guidance that's been coming out over the last kind of four or five years or so there's a huge raft of, 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 of guidance and, and, and good practice that's coming out that safeguarding leads just need to be keeping on top of so that's so that's just the safeguarding lead but obviously for the whole school for for, for all of the staff, it's really uh, very important that they not only get basic safeguarding training, but they're also accessing, you know, other, you know, training as well. So training, I think, very much on online harm, I would say, is, is, a, is a big issue, peer-on-peer -peer abuse um, and, and other kind of very specific topics, which is going to help them uh, be in a position to be able to, you know, support, you know, the, um, the, the school and the safeguarding lead. I think the other one that we've not really touched on too much during the course of the conversation is governance, you know, school, the importance of senior leadership in the school and the fact that school governors, I think nowadays, really do need to be <clears throat> well trained in understanding uh, safeguarding from a strategic perspective. You know, they really do need to understand their role and how they as governors can be in a position to be able to properly support the school, but at the same time challenge the school as well. Uh, and I think one of the one of the things that we've be, we picked up uh, on quite a regular basis, certainly over here, is I mean, if you look at some of the Ofsted inspections, for example, one of the main reasons why schools fail their safeguarding in an Ofsted inspection is because school governors and other senior leaders are not sufficiently uh, aware of the uh, the safeguarding responsibilities in the school. They're not aware necessarily of the safeguarding trends and the and the risks. That are apparent in in the school um, and without that knowledge it makes it incredibly difficult then for them to fulfill their uh, responsibilities mm. so i do really believe that you know as we said with the, the, the whole culture thing it starts with the leadership in the school doesn't it so therefore it's really important that the leadership in the school has sufficient uh, training um, to be able to undertake their role yes and I think it's important to think that, you know, training and development is continuous. It's not an event. It's not, we tick a box, oh, we've done our, 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 our training this year, great. Tick, <laughs> move on. It's actually a continuous conversation. So it doesn't need to be, you know, there will be a need for some set-piece training. If you've never been a DSL before and you're coming into the role, you clearly need some proper training. But in terms of the general development of, of staff, all staff, it needs to be part of an ongoing conversation, and it can be a 10 minute, uh, you know, in, in, as part of another training session, let's just talk about what the implications of that might be for safeguarding. Uh, it can be uh, the sorts of um, uh, curriculum issues, uh, because actually there are many times that you can bring safeguarding issues into the curriculum to ensure that both staff and pupils are talking about those really important yeah. issues uh, as part of the curriculum. Uh, so uh, training is kind of, Sometimes it's an event and sometimes it's something you need to attend. Uh, and certainly uh, the CPD training that, that, that we provide, you've got, you know, there is a pass fail element to it. It is not, uh, you know, frankly, rocking up, sitting in front of a bunch of PowerPoint slides and ticking your box to say I've attended. You know, that is not training. <laughs> you know, frankly, that, that you know, uh, uh, and there are some examples of really poor training around. It's really important that that training is rigorously delivered. Uh, and properly assessed uh, and well designed in the first place uh, but also that whole ongoing professional development piece really should be part of our daily work you know uh, and it should be on our radar the whole time about how we continuously improve this gentleman has been a really fascinating conversation 
Um, it's, it's longer than our typical podcast, but thank you very much for sticking with us, everybody. Um, we're going to make the video available. The, the lessons will be learned. Transforming, safeguarding in education. How can people get a copy of this book if they want to read and learn more? Okay, so the book uh, is, uh, will be uh, published on the 25th of May. Uh, it's available now for pre-order from uh, uh, Amazon, Waterstones, but also all good booksellers as well. And it's available internationally. Uh, so yeah, absolutely, uh, very easy to get hold of. It's available in uh, uh, paperback and in Kindle, uh, and it'll shortly be available as an audio book too. Martin Baker, Mike Glanville, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you for joining thank me you. on the Teach Middle East podcast. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Leisha.